while we're talking. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not trying to get crazy futuristic and headsets and all that. Um, but getting our heads around what it is, it kind of brings the whole concept of uh, the Internet as a, as a destination together. And it's funny because we closed down the office and, you know, I wonder even now why we even had it because n not too many people within 10 miles really, uh, you know, that, that makes up a very small fraction of the base of people that pay attention to Ropadope. Uh, and even to, and even to you guys, like you travel the world, you live in different places. You know, we, we can have a space, a virtual space, where everyone who has internet access can go to Ropado and can, you know, and can hang out. So, you know, it's, it's, it's taking shape in that way. And it's, it's really exciting. I just bought my first piece of virtual property. It's not property, really. It's a, um, yeah. it's an NFT that gives me the right to build uh, Good for in, you, a, man. in a space that doesn't really exist. So <laughs> it's, uh, super exciting. Are you, uh, just on, on that note, are you going to be in LA at any point in the next couple of months? I was just there for Christmas. Um, there's a chance. I'm just trying to think, uh, there's a chance. Why? What's, what's cooking? If you go to LA, let me know. Um, we have a, and this is confidential at this point, but there's a machine that's on loan called a hollow port from Microsoft you stand in the middle of it and it circles you with 200 cameras and creates your avatar of yourself for use in the metaverse. Wow. Yeah. Super exciting. <laughs> so okay. I'm, well, I'm flying out in March to get scanned and, and uh, you know, we have access to it because it's a, a rope it up artist that is, you know, uh, pioneering this with, with, you know, right. in conjunction with some people who do metaverse stuff. Um, I'll leave him on for a minute until they get it all set up. Sure. Um, but yeah, he's like, bring everybody through. Let's go. You know, so. And, at least and that, that avatar I can use, then I can use in a number of different ways, potentially in the, in the metaverse. It's kind of like my ID out there or. It's you. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. Well, that sounds like it might be worth going through to do that. Huh? I don't, they're, they're testing now. I, I don't, I don't think it takes any more than a couple minutes to have the thing scan around you, but I, you know, well, it's, yeah, I mean, cause I'm my, my, my sister and my sister-in-law and my mother-in-law are all in LA and my parents are in Happen Bay up, up in the Bay area. So there's, nice. you know, there's all these reasons. Good. Interesting. Yeah, man. Good to know. Yeah. So, uh, that, that's good. How, how are things with you? Everything cool? Yeah. Things are actually pretty stellar at the moment. I mean, it's a weird, it's a weird, you know, it's a weird time. I, I, uh, thought maybe I'd be on tour or something, but the Dixie chicks thing is not going to happen. So found that out. And as, as disappointing as that news was in the moment, it wasn't like totally, it wasn't shocking. I know how these things work. Right. I joined the band a week before the pandemic, you know, technically played my first song with them and the only song, one song. And, um, so anyway, wow. when I got that news in the fall, I was, you know, you, you get just disappointed, but then at the same time, the, the possibilities of, of what's, what can happen this year. Really cool. And especially the timing of this record coming out, I really have, have a chance to do some, some work and to play some shows and travel and to expand, you know, using this record as a conduit. And, um, so, uh, and on, in, on, in that, uh, regard, Victoria and I have, we went to France in November and I was teaching in Corsica, but we performed in Paris and had a lot of success, sold out a couple shows. Nice. Made some really good connections with, with musicians and friends. And then um, we just got back from, a, uh, we're a week in uh, Cabo at this hotel, this music hotel, El Ganzo. You ever heard of that thing? That no. Place? What is that? It's a very cool hotel run by some 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 folks that are into the arts and have budget for stuff. And they built a recording studio under the lobby and a trap door under the lobby. It's a good studio. They have real musicians up in there. People like Anderson Pack and um, Whitest Boy Alive, international artists. And 
you bring, they bring us in and they put you up and you create stuff for the week. You record stuff. And you, and what wow. we did was team with Victoria and I went with our friend, Bridget Carney from the band Lake street dive. She's a bassist. Oh, nice. And, and a writer. She's fantastic. And the three of us went and met a drummer from Berlin who got stuck there during the pandemic and an Argentine guitar player who was hanging there. And we spent the uh, week, you know, living in the hotel and recording tracks in the studio and basically made an album and made a whole new community of cool people. I mean, it's nice That's there, it. Cabo. Very nice. So That's it. And they have there, there was dancers in residence doing modern dance performances every day. There was a flamenco band doing a gig and all kinds of things. It was, you know, so it's the kind of stuff I didn't have time for in 2019 and 2018 and before. Yeah. A lot of times, it's not that I didn't have time for it. It was just hard to, hard to find space for everything, you know? So Amazing. thus far, uh, excited, feeling good, feeling healthy. I had COVID in December. It's been kind of, kind of like, I couldn't be happier that I had that. It was no, it was no big deal. And, uh, yeah. and now I can just live my life, you know, it's pretty great. That's awesome. Amazing. <laughs> good to hear. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Excited about the record. Excited about the record. Really excited. So we're and today. I guess we talk about the record. And are we? Do we do video? Is it video happening too? Like people are going to see me one day in this? Yeah, I have. I have video going. I'm watching the feed real quick. Um, I kind of have a new setup, yeah. so you'll see my eyes kind of. But I'm. I'm trying not to focus on that and just make sure that everything's no running tight. It dropped for a second, and I'm not sure why, but I think it looks stable now. Right. Um. Dumbest question of the world of the world. It is Deutsch, right? You do pronounce it in that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's right. cool. That's a smart question. These days, <laughs> we yeah. we have an artist. We're putting That's a record a smart out. Question. Her her name is Sarah Rachelle, but it's spelled R A C H E L E. So I was saying Rochelle, and I'm it seemed right to me, but yeah. So I like to double check. <laughs> All right, let's get, let's get started if you're ready. Ready. All right. Uh, we are here today with a gentleman that I met through uh, a, a good friend, Russ Kaplan. And the more I learn about this man, the, the, the more confused and intrigued I get. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Eric Deutsch. Eric, how are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. I say intrigued and confused because, you know, as the information comes in, I, I'm just looking right now at your bio uh, as we prepare for the release of your uh, March album, La Nuit Blanche, which I want to ask you about that title uh, in this process. But there's this combination of what most people would consider at least two, at least two different strands of music. Uh, we're talking about Dixie Chicks, a.k.a. The Chicks. Uh, perhaps Nora Jones is in the middle, but Roseanne Cash, Citizen Cope. And then you've got, and Leftover Salmon, of course. But then you've got Charlie Hunter in here. You've got Skerrick in here, Joe Russo, some familiar names. And then we bounce to Lucas Nelson. I want us to go back and, and, and kind of understand your, and Levon Helm in here as well. Uh, Gary Clark Jr. It, it, this just goes on and on. For people, people need to check this out. Um, but it's fascinating to me because I see different strains. So I want to go back and see how, how did you first come to music and how do you have such a broad range of experience? Okay. I, you know, I think that it's, I think it's, it's not that hard to explain probably in terms of some folks have these crazy varying careers without without uh, reason or without a clear explanation. I started piano um, in uh, 1982 in Nashville, Tennessee. I was born in Washington, D.C., but we were living in Nashville for a short time around in, in, the, in the 80s, about five years. Um, my dad is from D.C., my mom from Nashville. My dad's dad was a successful musician and also a... Um, a teamster. He was the president of the DC local for 35 years. So he was a lawyer. He was a gigging musician seven nights a week for decades. And then he was a president of the union. He went on to become the secretary of the international musicians union for a couple decades as well. I don't really even know what that is, but I know that it was something important. 
And um, so I think, so right there, what I've just told you, you got, you got, I'm coming from a little bit of a musical family. I'm coming from a musical family with a guy that also knew was pretty good at business and, you know, did different stuff. He wasn't just a player. And then the, com the combination of the East Coast thing and the Nashville thing, right? So started music in Nashville at Vanderbilt University and was a classical pianist. Um, but my first gig was uh, I won a songwriting competition and performed at the Country Music Hall of Fame, my song, with a, a Nashville songwriter. And, um, hey, Nata? Excuse me. There's a there's a puppy and she's a baby and she, she likes we have a we have a spe an unannounced special guest. <laughs> Let's say hi and then we let her out. Hi, this is Nata. <laughs> um, okay, so um, music roots in in the East Coast, music roots in Nashville. When I was back in Nash in uh, D.C. Uh, as a teenager. The other thing is I was a huge rock music and top 40 music fan my entire childhood, obsessed with the radio. Called the radio, waited on hold for hours. Did I, I was crazy with the radio. My dad was a little bit of a barroom piano. He liked the blues hmm. kind of guy. So back in DC in high school, I was a, a rock musician. I had bands, I did gigs. And then I got the jazz bug with my friends. We were jamming, I was in the jazz band. And then I kind of tapped into the DC scene, which was fairly rich and unique in that uh, in the early 90s. There was jam sessions, which we were invited to at old clubs, like the One Step Down and Twins Lounge and the HR uh, 57. Really cool stuff. I met um, inspiring musicians like local guys like James King and, and uh, Tommy Cecil. And then a really inspiring pianist, George Colligan who went on to uh, a lot of success in New York and beyond. And he was my teacher. And anyway, I just kind of dug into the jazz while well, always having these roots. And um, I should also say that I, when I was in Nashville, I was around country music. In the 80s in Nashville, country music really was intertwined in the fabric. It was a small town. And I went to elementary school with Waylon Jennings and Jesse Coulter's son, wow. Shooter Jennings. And wow. I remember uh, seeing Johnny Cash and Chris Christopherson at a, at a skating rink birthday party. And I remember seeing Barbara Mandrell singing at, a, at somebody's pool party and things wow. like that, you know? Um, so after the jazz bug got me in high school and it, and it got me pretty good by the end of high school, I, I, was, I was a little slow on it, but um, I ended up applying to some colleges, didn't know if I'd do music and ended up in Boulder where I was accidentally offered a jazz scholarship. Kind of surprisingly when I went to visit the school I just went to say hi to the piano teacher and he said, we jammed and he said, hey, I'll, I'll give you the scholarship. You know, and it was a small scholarship, but it was enough to say, hey, I should go to college here maybe because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Incredible. And uh, I didn't think it was music because I told you when my grandfather, he was a, he was a lawyer and a, and a, a businessman. And according to my dad, you kind of should have another job besides music. At least that's what my dad thought back then. Now, of course, after 30 years of watching me, we, you know, we, we all have different opinions, but, um, Anyway, went to Boulder and, and, and in that college experience, I not only did a lot of jazz, I played in a lot of different bands, played in reggae bands, rock bands, got my pop chops together, played some world music, played some Brazilian music. And I think Boulder in the 90s was a rich place musically in, in a lot of ways, and it was great. And um, I think given my background, I really had um, not only interest in these different styles, but some chops, you know, that I had le legitimately been around different musics Clearly. and in different parts of the country, you know? And um, so just wrapping that up is when I, I, I went to New York and I started to be presented with opportunities uh, like in the country music thing. It was, I, I guess it started with Shooter. I guess the country thing, I can't, Nora was before that, but when Shooter Jennings showed up in New York, Someone said, hey, didn't you go to elementary school with him? I think he's hanging around. He's looking for people to, to talk to. He was talking to Neil Casal and talking to, uh -huh. he was talking to Jeff Hill. And so um, I linked with Shooter and we bonded over having grown up together. And, and the special part of that bond is he was two years younger. He was in my brother's grade. And my brother had passed away in the early 2000s in a, in a car crash. So Shooter and I could bond over my brother and that relationship and Shooter said, man, I remember coming to your house and seeing you practicing piano and things like that. 
So we made an instant relationship. We made a band in New York. We made a couple records, a few records. And uh, I think that opened the door to me knowing other musicians in New York better that were involved in that scene, like the Mastersons and John Grayboff and the list goes on with that. And then uh, extending, I think Roseanne called me around then and Shelby Lynn and, and Allison Moore called me. And yeah, I just think it expanded. You were on the list, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. and the truth is, is that my skill set as a jazz pianist and pop pianist is almost used. It's used pretty fully in country music because you can kind of country music's looser than pop music. As a pianist, you kind of play behind the singer, where in pop music you kind of get out of, get out of the way and then drop it in your moments. You know, ah. country music you can kind of free flow behind whilst trying to not get in the way. I mean, this is just this is general, but. Yeah. That's something uh, that I, I, I think is, is right in there with what, what I like to do, and what I kind of have a nice, uh, you know, some sort of a, a skill set for it for whatever reason. So, and then you get to do your parts and you get to do your solos and, uh, you know, that's just something that fit. And meanwhile, the jazz thing always, always kept progressing. And I do think they're all connected, like I just said. And, and I was fortunate in New York to, you know, to, to expand into all kinds of, jazz circles and modern circles and improvisation circles and and also fortunate that I think the time when I hit New York I moved there in 2005 was kind of the time in my estimation when jazz musicians really exploded out of that box yeah you know and in 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 the end the music I've done the least in the last 25 years is straight ahead jazz Mm -hmm. And it's something I, I love doing, but it's just the, the music I've done the least. You know, it's it's I'm, I've been I've spent a lot more time in the Todd Sikafus, Charlie Hunter, mm -hmm. Knee Buddy, Allison Miller, Jenny Scheiman world of jazz, and that's just to name some of my friends that you know that I've worked with a lot. Rather rather than in, in the Ron Miles and, and the in the jam world, you know, um, rather than the straight ahead thing. And that's just how it ended up. And I think that's probably fortunate for me. It's amazing. I want to. I want to. For the band came to mind when you talked about. The, so this this is uh, you know news to me. Not being a musician, uh, I saw those two lanes as somewhat different. Um, but as you're speaking, I'm thinking of the band and Garth Hudson, and he's just kind of he's always there. You yeah. know, it may not be Doing what you're thing. hearing at the beginning, yeah. like what the structure of the song is, but it's, it's, it's always there filling in the, is that what you mean? That kind of. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think Garth is a really great example of like what he did in the band, which is a roots Americana band, you know, at, at its core, yep. what he was doing was fairly avant-garde, you know, and using strange synthesizers and that Lowry organ and this arps and and his approach and, and even his stage setup, you know, with the crooked keyboards dangling and on diagonal, it was kind of a, uh, it, it, you know, you, you, you can't help but to think of people like Sun Ra or like, you know, other kinds of galactic kind of avant-garde approaches. So I think that that's a great example of just doing his thing in that music. And Garth, I think, has had a long career of doing things in all kinds of music. People just, you know, know him most for that, of course, but um, yeah. That's exactly a good example. Just doing a quick technical check here. These are the days cool. where I have to do do everything. Uh, though I like it. I like working at home. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, the, for me, the band is, is, is my favorite of all time. Like, every, people ask that question, yeah. you know, and I, I always go back there. So, of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that in. That's what it's going to remind me of. Um, but I do, and I do note, as you were mentioning, like a lot of the jazz musicians in the lane that are, that are listed on your bio are, are not necessarily in that straight ahead lane. They're, they're, you know, throughout the last 15, 20, possibly even more years, they, they've been really pushing, uh, to kind of expand what jazz really is, uh, or, or just not, yeah. not jazz, you know, just do just doing their thing. Yeah. <laughs> How did you meet Russ Kaplan? I need to, I need to get to this. We went to high school together. Really? Yep, Potomac, oh. Maryland, Churchill High School. Russ was a year younger than me and was a pianist, keyboardist in 
most of the ensembles that I was in the uh, the jazz band. And uh, I mentioned my brother, who's two years younger. So it tended to be myself, Russ, and my brother in most of the ensembles. And uh, we were in the jazz band. And then there was a thing called the Showstoppers, which was like kind of a, a big shot traveling show choir for all the best musical theater and singer folks at our high school. And we made up the band of that. So we, we worked together musically in high school. And then in college, Russ was in Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon. And I had my band Fat Mama with Joe Russo. That was my right. initiation into the jam band world. And um, my really my initiation into the, the traveling music, musical world. And uh, I remember going through Carnegie Mellon and Russ coming out to, to see the band. And he was somewhat of a fan. And, and we stayed in touch ever since. And when I moved to New York, Russ uh, became one of my students. And that was 2005. And he still takes lessons to this day. I would say that he is officially my longest running student. He checks in. Russ is a very successful, accomplished musician on all kinds of, he does all kinds of things I could never right. do. Right. And, uh, but he still checks in every few months. And uh, I, I love that guy and loved, you know, doing the project with him last year and meeting you guys. Yeah, the the Nine Takes project, I recommend that people go back and, and take a look at that. It was a really interesting lockdown scenario where, where uh, songs were passed around the world uh, to, to just about every continent. And uh, you guys took a lot of risk, and, and it, it, it was really uh, quite a thing. Um, I, I just want to comment on the side real quick about Russ Kaplan. So, like, in, in the Times here, when, you know, you, get, you open up your email and, and a musician says, I have a project – that I'd like you to consider. Uh, and, you know, here at rope -a -Dope, sometimes the, the stranger, the better, or the more unique, the better. And, uh, you know, my email from Russ was, you know, I have this album and it's based on Ulysses. <laughs> Are you interested? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> let's go. Let's do it. So let's move ahead. That is fascinating, and I've and I've I've already learned so much. I'm going to go back to some to some of this. I you know I was kind of reminded of listen. You know I used to listen to the Grateful Dead a lot, and I've been listening again recently. And yes, it's funny yes. how much you know there was Marty Robbins, there was Johnny Cash, all that stuff was in that. So like there's that there's that connection in the in the jam band world of having those kind of rollicking, you know country songs americana songs yeah. yeah a songwriting connection for sure right it's like we didn't i mean i think a lot of musicians get through the dead got, or, or a lot of a lot of music fans through the dead got turned on to to songs that they would have never l thought they liked you know what i mean and or wouldn't have been played on radio yeah you just you just yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and and you know what it, that's just like the a final thing on that is the one thing i always say is like whatever style if the song is good and then it, it, and it might sound like a cliche, but it's so true. Like if it's a good song, it's not, it, it's not hard to find a way to, to contribute musically. You know, that's, that, that's, that's the greatest thing in the world. Just finding, finding good artists to work with. And I've been, I've been blessed to, to be around a lot. I think I lost your sound, Lewis. Oh, sorry. There you are. And there's the tech, uh, and and you have a lot of uh, great uh, great musicians on this record. La Nuit Blanche, excuse my French, um, <laughs> literally. Um, <laughs> the White Knight. The White Knight, and it's it's a French, uh, pretty common term I've learned. I had I didn't know the term, so huh? what I do is I write down things I hear in the wild. You know, in my phone, I do it. <laughs> I've done it for years and I I go back and I look at them and I say a lot of them are like middle of the night like where did I where did I hear that but um, I write things down and I make them song titles or maybe album titles and um, this is one I didn't know um, I was in Corsica doing a, a teaching thing at this I music school where I'm a an online virtual professor and uh, that was in 2018 and uh, this one of the producers said something about La Nuit Blanche, and I said, "What is that?" He said, "Oh, it's when you—it's an all-nighter. Ah. It's a ter French term for an all-nighter." Ah. And I said, "It's kind of funny. It's kind of vibey, and it's kind of—I I also like things that are kind of funny a lot of times in my titles." And I love 
I've been doing it for a long time using using Spanish in my titles. I have an album, Demonio Teclado, and uh, from ten years ago. And um, I'm I'm really into other languages. Living, you know, as an expat, mostly living in Mexico these days. Um, so I wrote it down, and I wrote a little snippet when I was there at the I Music School. I tend to write a lot of my songs in uh, a lot of my songs starting with snippets or little ideas, uh -huh. little themes. And I write those in sound checks. I don't know. It's just become the thing for the last five years. And, and um, my friend Bridget Carney told me last week when I was talking to her about this, she said, oh, yeah, that's because like you're distracted. And they say that creative juices really flow when you're not sitting down like I got to write a Trying song. Trying to do it. It's just yeah. I'm waiting at sound check. I'm waiting for someone to be like, play that other keyboard. And I just start messing around. Also, the keyboards are cool. They sound like in Leftover Salmon. I had the clav and the Moog and the Whirly and the organ. Right. This one was at the iMusic school. I'd be sitting there waiting to film videos for the online. And um, in between takes, I was just constantly noodling, constantly. Cause I just felt like noodling. And it's one of those situations where you can, and it's not annoying, you know? And I came up with a, an idea. That's the theme for the title track, La Nuit Blanche. And so the, the uh, title fit, cause I had come up with it there, you know? And um, Beautiful. also when you, when you start to, I, a lot of times that, you know, I get these titles and I get these ideas and then I kind of, kind of, uh, kind of check out the meaning with them after. So it's a little, you know, maybe it's, you know, it's less inspired than someone might imagine or something, but it's just a backwards process in that way. And, uh, you know, an all nighter, there's light, there's dark, there's darkness, there's, there's, you know, sometimes uh, inspiration mm -hmm. and, um, of course, there's a pandemic that never, that seemed like a never ending, you Seems know, like an all night. night. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? And we're, so, we're waiting, we're waiting for the sun to come up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. So mm -hmm. it just, all these things kind of made sense. And, um, uh, when, when y'all check out the cover art, I had an artist friend of mine make a piece of visual art. That's a photo that when you look at it from different sides, it's got, um, a very different, uh, uh appearance of my face. And one side kind of white and pristine, the other side dark and like a skeleton. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So the artwork goes along with it. There's a little gif that we'll be putting out that people can see the video of how you look at it from side to side. Good. So good. I can't um, wait to see it when it's printed. Yeah, yeah it's, and, and it's, really a, it's, it's an interesting thing. So that's, that's where it came from. Spending time uh, internationally is just something that's really a focus and a, and a, and a, a joy of mine in my life and spending time in France has been something that's been really cool in Corsica the last few years. So, you know, this title just seemed to, I like, I like a title that evokes an image. I like a cinematic title, you know, and uh, there it is. I love the explanation. I mean, my, my first impression was that it was a play on words of the white knight with a K, um, but it makes sense. So it's the white, the white knight, meaning the knight that turns to light. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. I have a random uh, question that has little to do with music, but uh, I'm I'm cool. also looking at our uh, media center here, and we have five press photos for you. Uh, three of which you are not wearing shoes. <laughs> so, really? Yeah. <laughs> Just I I wouldn't have known that if you had pointed that out. Um, and I I actually tend to wear shoes a lot, but Mexico is a is a warm place and um maybe with it, with those vibes and my photographer who, who did the shoot andres who's great and victoria who was basically styling they must have at some point been like lose the shoes you know let's let's go without them it's so. a great vibe it it, it adds a very uh -huh. casual free-spirited kind of feel to the whole thing i like it i like it we'll see who uh, we'll see who notices out there out there in the world uh so I, I got to, you know, just in listening to this, uh, you know, a few times, I really got a, got a distinctly kind of Western South, not, not South, Southwestern, but sort of that romantic, you know, open road, you know, driving across the West kind of vibe. Is that, okay. do you see that? I mean, does that feel? Well, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of that and I've been driving around Mexico literally, you know, through wide open deserts and things since the pandemic kicked in. Victoria and I got a car and 
we'd, we'd made the 12 hour drive to Oaxaca to the beach four times. Mm. So mm. in 2020, uh, 2021, I guess. And, um, you, I, you know, my Colorado time, I even had a band called County Road X 20 years ago. That was literally a wide open spaces kind of band with cello and pedal steel guitar. And so I think I've been involved in that. So that sounds been involved in my composition and my arrangement for a long time. And uh, yeah, if that makes sense. You know, I, 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 I can't always say where my stuff comes from, but that, but just not, not uh, just cause I don't, I'm not sure, but yeah, hmm. that, that does make sense. I'm glad you're hearing that. I, I hadn't, you know, we had a conversation the other day with someone and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Like when I'm, when I'm here, when I'm hearing horns, for example, uh, or, or even a vocalist, I, I like to hear breath, right? Because I can feel the presence of the player as I'm mm -hmm. listening to the music. And I hadn't even considered that around piano. But in re-listening to music lately, I'm starting to kind of feel the the sensitivity, I guess, the, 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 the fingers, right? And the touch version of that yeah. hearing breath um wow. how much piano, are you playing does, do you think you know, about it's that? Funny that it's funny that you mentioned that the piano does also kind of breathe a little bit or make a breathing sound when you let up the sustain pedal when the hammers kind of the dampers move right. you know and the felts kind of there's a there's a little bit of a, a a hushing sound in there and i think that has to do some with the fingers i think that i think that this record when you put it like that, I've never exactly thought about breath connected to touch on the piano, but except with space, you know, breath oh, right. and phrases. Mm -hmm. I've talked about that for a long time. My teacher, Art Lane, talked about that breath all the time and that kind of idea of phrasing, but, um, and lyricism. But mm -hmm. uh, you know what? This record, I'll tell you what, I, I went in there with the idea that I was not going to overplay and that I was going to bring a softer touch to this music than I had probably ever done before. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was one of my main goals. And Beautiful. I was fortunate that the instrument they had at the studio at, at GB's juke joint, Long Island city, which is insanely nice. It was my first time there. The instrument they had in there was a nine foot Steinway B and it was stunning. You barely had to do anything. And it just, it just, it just made a beautiful sound and you could fly on it or just play simple on it. And it sounded good. And I've always been like a Fender Rhodes guy. And like, I, I dig in, you know, and the, the jam band right. thing with Sam right. and I was definitely a, a dig in gig mm -hmm. and clavinet doing the, the rhythms and the, mm -hmm. the clav, the clav grass, I called it. But, mm -hmm. um, man, there was, this was the most, um, the most uh, aware of my touch I've ever been on, on, on one of my records where it, it's not that I'm, I'm always aware of it as a pianist, but I just was a, there was a focus to be light, to mm. not push. And, and the band played to that dynamic. Tony Mason uses a lot of brushes on this record gotcha. and that's new and different for me too. And so it allowed me to, to do that, I think. Yeah, it's kind of like on that drive. It's the, the the seat is kicked back a little bit, and there's one hand on the wheel. That's kind of the, kind of the vibe that I'm feeling. Yeah, I love that, man. Yeah. And I'll tell you one other thing is that post pandemic, you know, I hadn't played a a, a a gig in in a year and a half or something, and I recorded in April 2021, and I think that or you know over a year, I was nervous about about my ability to really like throw down. Right. <laughs> I kind of wasn't in the head. I didn't feel like the guy who had been on stage with Sam and just playing for three and a half hours, playing five minute solos, you know, sometimes and I, I didn't feel, I didn't, I didn't feel like that guy I felt like I was in a different space and it ended up being okay. But I, I was a little nervous about what it was, what I was capable of energetically it just felt a little strange. It's the first longest break, like everybody else that I'd taken in my life, you know, my adult life of music. So, uh, performing. So that was part of that approach, and I'm really, I'm really glad I came up with that. Yeah, I've talked to, to quite a few musicians about that concern and, and, and trying to have the discipline in, the, in this whole process of, of, of practice and regular playing and not drifting away from, from that. 
um, and I think that's something important for people who listen to these podcasts to understand who who aren't musicians that it's not just magic, you know. <laughs> there's there's it, there's a there's a repetition process and that that sure. that matters. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the process you you would you you wrote these songs. How, how do you how do you go into the studio and and do this? Are you charting everything out and then sort of sharing it with everyone and? So yeah, it was it was a unique a unique one because the band had never played anything, and I was going for my second vaccine in New York, and I I thought well, these New York trips aren't that cheap, <laughs> and why not why not do a, do a recording while I'm there? And um, you know I had some pandemic assistance. Uh, you know, from some different places and shout out to the chicks actually, because they kicked in some assistance that I used to, 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 uh, to pay for the album, which That's is great. pretty awesome. And, um, looking at studios, Jeff Hill, my longtime collaborator, uh, bassist and a uh, mixing engineer on my last four records, I think he, um, he said, Hey, I'm, I got a new room at this studio, uh, GBs, uh, Hector Castillo's up in there, a fantastic engineer. And, and some other guys, it's awesome. So the studio came together for a really nice deal and really cool bargain. It's a big studio so we could fit the whole band. And I, I basically, I, I took those songs little by little, like the one I described a lot in the week, I had a cell. And during the pandemic, more or less, I turned them into songs. So I got a good hook. I'm kind of a hooky writer, uh, an instrumental hook. I'm like, okay, I got yeah. this thing. This is a good, this is a good one. And I can recognize a good one usually versus an okay one. And then I say, how do I turn this into a song? And it's a tricky process because you don't want to ruin it with a bunch of a bunch of writing that's not as good as the hook. You want you want that thing to, mm. if it is good, to really stand you know stand out, stand the test of time as that song goes on. But um, so I, you know I go through that process, and, and it's not always. Occasionally, I have a song pop out like a songwriter, like like you want to think that like Imagine did you know just came out one day you know. Occasionally that happens, but. Um, Usually I'm, I'm, I'm building like a composer, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, so I kind of built these songs during the pandemic and I kind of was like, hmm, I guess I got a, I guess I got six of them. One of them was for the nine takes session, Lockdown, my song. And um, I don't know if you put that together, but that's the one that I recorded in nine takes. It's track five on the record. Oh yeah. And um, so I didn't even that was, and obviously that title, that was the first thing I wrote right when we got into this lockdown. But I also imagine that it was like a, uh, could be the theme song to like a prison movie, you know, some sort of hard boiled movie. Mm -hmm. And um, what I did when I decided to do the record, I made recordings here at home, um, which is something I got better at during the pandemic on, on my, lucky we got my Steinway here from New York mm. and I made the recordings and uh, just did solo piano recordings, sent it to the guys with, with lead sheets and I, I almost, I usually have a little idea of drums, but my thing with my band is like, I always, I always believe that those guys are, are way better than me at those instruments. And so they, I need them to come up with the parts. So like, I, I usually have an idea for drums and bass lines, but just an idea. And I always say, Tony, if you got something better, please, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Avi Bortnick, my guitarist, and these are guys now that have been in my band some of them over 10 years. Um, and that's kind of a feat because in New York, I was always changing bands It was for, for availability and you fall in love with every musician you meet, you know, there's so many amazing guys and girls. Um, so anyway, I, I, uh, Avi Bortnick's like the master of rhythm guitar. And, and I say that with the, with a, with a preface that John Schofield hired him to play rhythm, rhythm guitar in his uh, band. Uh. <laughs> The last 25 years so you know that says something and so avi i always say avi i need a you know i need a rhythm part but i don't know what it is i just say i know he'll come up with something perfect and um i think the most you know, unique thing about this record uh, arrangement wise was that the horns brian dry and mike mcginnis friends that i've known since the late 90s early 2000s and they work great together they're like brothers hmm. i said guys I, and I've been leaning this way over time, but I said, I'm going to play most of the melodies. I think 15 years ago, I wrote all the melodies for the horns and kind of had everybody doing all this stuff. But I've been leaning towards the piano leading most of the melodies. 
and the horn's doing other stuff. So I said this time, I'm going to play most of them. I'm going to give you guys a little bit, but I want you to play the whole time. I don't want you to just play solos, you know? And I said, I basically wanted them to improvise backgrounds the entire record. And I imagined like a headhunters y kind of thing. When I think of headhunters, I think of Benny, the sound of headhunters, not like the tunes or what, you know. I think of uh, the, the soundscape. I think of Benny Moppin's like bass clarinet just like being in there like droning and, 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 and kind of just like, just like horn drones, horn, horn chords. And I think it was no uh, a coincidence that we did use a lot of bass clarinet on the record. We used a lot of flute. And uh, I just told those guys, man, just find chords and play pads and find cool things to play and just, and just play. And mm -hmm. I, love, I love when horn players are interactive in the ensemble and not just playing melodies and solos. Love that, you know? And it's kind of magical to find a balance where guys can improvise parts and jump in on a melody and jump in on a solo and know when to lay out, you know? Yeah. And that's kind of where we're at with this band now that we've been doing it long enough. And, and I'm really uh, grateful for all these, all these musicians. It, it, it comes off as seemingly effortless, uh, but you know, and then, you know, it's not, but, but it just but feels I, like, you know, I'm, yeah. like I said, the guys had never heard it except for my piano demos and we got in the studio and we basically just rehearsed each song a few times and hit court record right away. And, and by a couple takes, two, three takes, we had them. And it, it was, it was, it felt easier than it, than it should have been. You know, it felt like we were getting away with something, but <laughs> I like that. And I'm, I'm pretty good at trusting, like, I'm great at being like, I think that was fine. And some other guys in the band might've been like, even the next day, like, hey, should we go back and do that again? You know, I don't know if I knew what I was doing. I said, that. Ah. It's cool. I, Good. Lewis, with, with Charlie Hunter, Charlie really showed me how to be a little less precious with mm. music. And I, and I mean that with a, a, a hundred percent sincerity. And I think it's really good for the kind of music that we do. It, it's good. To, you got to take your music seriously and you got to give it your all, but the goal is to make a lot of it, I think. And mm. also not every solo can be your best and not every tune can be your best. And not every, you know, you know, I mean, you can try to make it that, but just to say, Hey, it's cool. That solo's cool. You know? Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's, that's, that's true mastery when, when, when you can not be trying, not, not be appearing to be trying too hard. And, you know, there, there, there's plenty of music out there. Uh, and, and look, you know, it captures, it captures a person's, uh, vibe at a given time in their life um but there's a lot of like you know overly important kind of kind of kind of vibes uh yeah so and you know as you. musicians we've got to do that sometimes i guess um i just i'm really happy to feel comfortable with my band and to feel comfortable with most mistakes huh. and to feel comfortable with just the realness you know there's a great story from uh that i that i always pay attention to you know it's funny here here at rope it up people want to send me de demos or rough cuts and I, and I say no and and the reason i say no is because often i'll like the rough cut better better than the finished uh master but um i read a thing about sam phillips uh at sun studios sam phillips i think so yeah yep. um elvis cut his first track and and wanted to redo it because he made a mistake and he refused he said that's what makes it human it's the error that makes it human. So, that, yeah, man, it's uh, the you know the first take magic is a cliche, but it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, sometimes it's just nice to play and be like, hey, that that's cool. Let's well, move on. Well, I think it's yeah, I think it's needed right now. I mean, th there's a certain easiness to this, as I've mentioned a couple of times, a certain uh, just sense of comfort and 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 vibe and and joy and excitement and you know such a needed thing right now. We need we need some things to stretch out to and just just sort of bring some positive energy back into the space. So I you know thank you for that. Um, sure. I can feel it and I I think people are going to feel it. I hope they do. Um, 
and just you know, just yeah. I mean, the the world is full of struggle, and thank you for 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 taking uh, your time to translate it and transform it into something beautiful. That's uh, so much appreciated. Thank you, Louis. I, I'm I feel like somehow I'm not sure why, but I do feel like that this record has a has a has an ease to it and to like sonically. It's listenable. It's, it feels mm. like a record that people can put on and, and, and listen to. And it's not because we didn't take risks or take energetic solos or, you know, there's just something mm. to the sound of it. That's I think um, uh, nice on the ears. And I, I'm, I think it's, you know, I, I've accomplished something new in that way, or, or I've accomplished something that I wanted to accomplish with, with this record. And I'm really, I'm really happy that you feel Beautiful. that way. So just to sum up, La Nuit Blanche comes out on March 4th, 2022 from Eric Deutsch. And uh, check at ropeadope.com. Uh, we'll, ha we'll have it all there. Eric, thank you so much. I appreciate you. My pleasure. It's great to see you. It's great to work with you.